totally be involved in something and totally forget that the Lord's even there. So I remembered while standing up here, Aaron saying to me while Kevin and Annie and Aaron and I were playing golf together, and I've really had some, some just weird stuff going on in my swing for a while. And so, you know, from one game to the next, it could be really, really bad. And I'm struggling, you know, inside because I'm really competitive and wanting to not, not necessarily so much to beat Kevin as much as just to play well enough to feel good about my game, to be honest with you. You know, seriously. Um, and it's been forever since I have, even though we've gotten close a couple of times, but been forever since I've actually, you know, won a game with Kevin. He does really well. But anyhow, I just want to do well in what I'm doing. And she said to me, why don't you play out of your spirit? Use your spirit. Play from your spirit. And, uh, you know, that's really good in theory. Are you with me? I mean, I know he can play really good, that spiritual man. How do I do that? And I was sitting there thinking the reason why I wasn't able to accomplish that is one reason. You know what it is? The game meant too much to my flesh. Can't play out of the spirit when you're like this. In other words, for me to play out of my spirit, I would have had to have said, all right, not one shot matters to me, whether it's good or whether it's bad. I won't, I won't get more excited, even though I may say, someone say, hey, that's a good shot. Thank you. Appreciate that. I'm, I'm not going not gonna to go, wow, that was a great shot inside or that's such a horrible shot on the outside. It's not the shot means nothing. The score means nothing. Everything is about the enjoyment of the moment. The people that we're playing with and being able to what? Then let God be included because he's not pushed away from me giving such tangibility to the flesh. Because as long as the flesh has so much tangibility, the spiritual man cannot. You can't multitask in the spirit. Okay? So as long as it meant so much to me, and my competitiveness, because, you know, competitiveness is not going to be something that's going to be happening in heaven. I'm just telling you, it's a, that's a fleshly, worldly concept that I'm going to compete against you. And my whole life is nothing but everything in me is competitive. I'm driven with, with competitiveness. I remember Tony Cook one time said, I've never met anybody more competitive in my life than Jim Hawkins. <laughs> It's probably because we haven't played football, you know. I just, you know, if I went by him, I'd give him a little, I'd give him a little forearm, you know, just let him know I was there, you know. Hello, praise the Lord, Pastor Shield. It's good to have you in the service. Amen. Keep on talking. I like it. Amen. So as long as it means so much to me, and I elevate that, then I what? Then I decrease. And lower my spiritual connection. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Reverend Annie talked about that yesterday. To be absent from the body means that if you're going to use that for life, it means that you don't put any value on what's going on in your body, which gives you all the value to put into Jesus. Now, value is a numerical term, is it not? So if I've got a hundred points that I can either give away or embrace, if I give them all away to my flesh, I've got nothing left to give to Jesus. So you can't say, well, I can do both. No, you can't. Jesus said that very, very strongly over in Matthew chapter 6. You can't serve two gods at the same time. If you love God, you don't love mammon. If you love mammon, you don't love God. I mean, he made it really clear. So as I was sitting there, I was just thinking, or standing there, we were worshiping, I was just thinking that, you know, as I'm talking today, kind of bringing some thoughts around, 
you know, to play out of my spirit, to live out of my spirit. Oh, this is a life in the spirit conference. Oh, that's right. I have to keep turning around to make sure that's the right conference that I'm in. I'm going to have to devalue the flesh so that I can bring up a spiritual respect, honor, and importance to the things of God. And that's why the Lord said, unless you're willing to lose your life in this lifetime, you won't be able to find it. Now, wait a minute. Find it? You mean I can't even find me unless I'm willing to lose me? That's a concept. Come on, somebody. Think about that for a moment. Nothing in this world right now is about you losing you. Everything in this world is about you just magnifying your flesh. Come on, think about it. I took one selfie, sent it to my oldest daughter. She laughed so hard and said, Dad, never do that again. <laughs> but this is what, where the world is at. And we know, know this is going to be true because, you know, it's already been prophesied about. Paul talked about it. So I've got to lose myself. What does it mean to lose myself? Let go of the importance of anything that you have within your thoughts about your life and have nothing but your thoughts about God in your life. Because the moment you put him first, that's the beginning of you finding him. And if you can find him, you'll find you. Because he's in you. Come on, everybody. This is really good. In life, you know, we're just told, we're taught how to become chameleons. We become different things for different people. That's just kind of a standard practice anymore. People don't maintain who they really are. They'll change to this person and change to this person and change to this person. Right? My youngest daughter, you know, for our last parent-teacher conference, I've said this before, but it's still good. We walked in. It was a gentleman that was a teacher. Sat down. He said, Mr. and Mrs. Hockaday, I look forward to talking to you about your daughter, Chloe Hockaday. And, of course, Chloe was the naughty child. She was cute as can be. She looked like Shirley Temple with, you know, just big old curls that snapped right back up. So, you know, you couldn't kill her or anything. But, I mean, you know, from the standpoint that, you know, you couldn't spank her every day. But you wanted to, you know. We certainly gave her enough spankings to correct her. But. She just flat would do the same thing over again and smile while she's doing it. So we didn't know what we were going to hear from him. And we were well prepared, embraced, sitting in our chairs. And then he started out by saying, if there were more students in this school like your daughter Chloe, it would be a better place. (laughs) That's what I did. (laughs) Yeah. I said, could you explain that, please? Because that that took us, you know, back a little bit. We were waiting to hear, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Hockett, I just really need need your help to work with her a little bit. I know, we're working with her. (laughs) And so I said, would you tell us why? And he said, well, your daughter's very sharp, very smart. She'll get her work done before others. And she'll just on her own, she'll go around the class and see if any of the other students need help. Now, I'm sitting here, and Aaron's sitting here, and when he said that, Aaron's foot came over and touched my foot. (laughs) When it touched my foot, that gesture seemed to indicate I needed to ask him about his comment. So I said, did you use the word help? (laughs) And he said, yes, I did. I said, is there anything else? He said, well, actually, there is. He said, after the class, I've never asked her to or never told her to, but she'll just come up to the front of the room And clean everything up before uh, the next class so that I'm prepared for my next class. And I've never asked her to do it. Now Aaron's foot that's now touching my foot (laughs) was now pushing against my foot. So that I had to put weight on my foot to keep it from being moved. And that gesture said, you better ask him about that. So I said, did you use the word clean? He (laughs) said. He said, yes, I did. And my next comment was, I'd really like to meet this person. (laughs) 
That afternoon, Chloe came home and she said, well, how'd it go? And I said, oh, we found some amazing things about you. She said, okay, what were they? I said, what we found out is that you like to help and you like to clean. So after mom gets done with dinner tonight, you can jump right up and help her clean up. No, we didn't just leave her there. We told her how proud we were of her. But, but here's the thing. Isn't it interesting that you're one thing to your parents, you're another thing to the teacher, and you're another thing to your relative? Oh, those relatives. Yes, you're another thing to them. And so the world's not helping us to locate us. But you can only locate you when you're willing to actually let go of you. Yes. Amen. Yes. I mean, maybe this is going to help my golf game if, if I go into just literally saying, okay, today means absolutely nothing to me except I'm with amazing people. I'm out here on God's amazing earth and I'm experiencing some beautiful sunshine and I'm going to have a great day. So now I can play out of my spirit. Amen. <laughs> The only problem is I've just let Kevin know how to do it, so he'll play out of his spirit too. So, you know, unless my game gets better, he's still going to probably win. Yeah, so see. Well, if he's already doing it, then when I start to do it, we may find some things equal out. Okay, okay, okay. Which is very interesting that friends, we are friends, we are friends, we are friends to the bitter end. No, not those kind of friends. That's, that's Disney right there, okay? But we're friends, and he hasn't told me how to do it. So he's been keeping this to himself. So thank you, Lord, for showing me right here in this service how to maybe get back into the game. Amen. This is very, very interesting what we're talking about. That you've got to actually let go of you. So for a moment here, let me just share a couple things, and I'm hoping that uh, uh, our friends here, maybe Leanne or Annie, will also have something that would be very helpful here as well. But um, if you don't mind, go over to Matthew in chapter 6 for just a second, and I'll use this as a place just to start a couple of thoughts here, Matthew chapter 6. And I'm looking now in the Message Bible. Some of you know where I'm going with this. But this is a wonderful scripture, and it's one of my favorites here in verse 6. And it says in the Message Bible, here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. That's not always easy for everybody. Because it means you can't pretend with yourself anymore. You're going to have to just go down to bare bones of who you are, and that may look ugly. Now, I know who you are in Christ, but I'm talking about how you do life. Because how you do life will translate into how you do faith. And if you don't use your faith to find him... You're going to always just have theology, but you're not going to have experiences. You've got to use your faith to find him. You know, Leanne shared a good, a wonderful story last night about praying. And here she's just kind of praying. I like that. What'd you say? Like a dead cow, you know, or something, you know, we've all been there. Have we not all been there? Where that flesh is taken over and you're kind of tired, but you know you're trying to pray, but you got to pray through that flesh. And what did the Holy Ghost say? Come, what are you doing? Why don't you pray like you're already there? Oh, that's an interesting thought. I still remember that. No, that was not a thought that I had. That was a thought that Leanne had that we then took and began to use. Remember that? Yeah, it was great. We worked with each other. God would give her just a few things and gave him me most of the things. <laughs> and then she used all those, most of those things that I gave her for the next 15 years. No. <laughs> now, God, gave us, God would give us things together, you know, like this. Because we, we were just uh, very, very in a place of humility, asking God to help us every single day. So it wasn't like we thought we ever knew what we were doing. We just never told people that what we just experienced was a first for us. 
We'd act like, praise the Lord, amen, look at what God just did. But yet it was the very first experience. You go back going, can you believe that? <laughs> so that was pretty fun. But yeah, I mean, the Lord showed that to her, and it helped me, because she came in and shared that with me. It's like, well, let's do that, because I know how to do that. I just didn't see it like that, but the moment I saw it, we just went places that you couldn't go unless you did it by faith. So see, if you're praying in the Holy Ghost, if you're endeavoring to find God and you're waiting until you find Him to find Him, you're waiting until you get there to get there, it's going to be a long time before you get there. And that's the sad thing because it's going to be just kind of hit and miss. Every once in a while, you'll have, whoa, man, did you sense the presence of God today? Well, why is it so new to you? You've been doing this day after day. Did you see the things we saw? Well, why is it so new to you that you finally saw something? Because Jesus lived his life seeing and doing, hearing and saying. He lived his life like that. We are to live our lives like this. Well, yeah, but I'm just very rarely have those experiences. Then you need to do it by faith. You step into a place because it's there for you. Remember, this is not... Uh, you know, Christian science, where we're trying to make something up. This is not new age. They try to copy us. What God has laid before us is real. We're accessing what's already there by our faith. We are not creating something that isn't there that God hasn't made. Everything we have the privilege of walking in dominion and authority in has to do with what he's already laid out for us to walk in. We don't create a new area of dominion and authority in the Godhead because we've been raised up to sit in heavenly places. We operate in what he's already laid out as a plan for us to operate in. And in that plan, we use our authority and our dominion by, help me, faith. Faith, and we get there because we believe we're there. And the belief of being there is what gives you the experience of there. Which means whether I'm having a great day or not a great day, whether I feel good or don't feel good. Whether there's pressures or no pressures. Whether I'm walking through a park and it's so peaceful. Or I'm walking through the chaos of a city that has so much business and busyness. The devil can't take away my faith and ability to put myself with a belief in a better place. You could put us all in front of a firing squad and he still can't take away your ability to be in a better place. God gave us that and no man can take it away. Jesus even said, the Father's given me power to, to lay my life down and power to take my life back up. And I'll lay it down when I'm good and ready to lay it down. And no one will make me lay it down until I lay it down. And as a result, those came with all kinds of hideousness and hate to throw them over the brow of the hill. And he walked right through the midst of them and they never touched him. This is what he gave Peter. Now we know Peter didn't always use his brain. There were moments when Peter did things where there was a detachment from his thought. Like, Lord, bid me come if it's you. Come. And he gets out and he walks. Until then he attached his brain again. And then he began to look and he began to consider something that he already walked on. He should have been skipping that I'm walking on it instead of considering it to be something that was bigger than what he had just experienced. So see, when you think, you sink. So some of you need to turn off your thinker so that you can walk out of your heart. 
But look, at hanging out with Jesus caused Peter to take out his fillet knife and go after the high priest's servant's ear. Well, that's going to really help, Peter. <laughs> Thank you for your enthusiasm, but put your knife away. Right? I mean, how ridiculous is that? But why would Peter actually respond that way? Because nobody takes Jesus. It doesn't matter if there's a, a soldiers. It doesn't matter if there's a crowd that's going to throw him over the brow of the hill. We watch this guy walk right through the midst of them, and they don't even touch him. He's untouchable. You can't defeat him, and we're with him. Notice that the tangibility of the Christ, the proximity, the awareness, the recognition. Amen? Come on. All these words are the key buzzwords for your salvation and for where we're going. And if you don't have these words, recognition of the Lord's presence, amen, awareness of your spirit and his spirit in you, amen, the tangibility of God that comes upon me. If you don't have this, it probably has been taken away from religion, by religion. And you're just a shell. Because it's this awareness that made Peter so bold. And it's the lack of awareness that made him ba -ba a chicken. Because the moment he was taken away, Peter couldn't stand up to anybody. Aren't you one of the ones? No. How come he was all of a sudden so squirmish? How come he lost his confidence? Because his confidence was attached to the tangibility of Christ. The awareness, the recognition, the realness, his closeness, the proximity. Now, he had Christ with him. We have Christ living in us. How could we let religion do this to us? He's living inside of us. We're never out, out of this proximity. We're never separated He's always there, even unto the end of the age. Amen. He lives within us. This is not just him, but he brought his glory, and he brought his ability and his power. We're powerful. What does the world love? Marvel movies. Because the people in the Marvel movies, the characters have certain powers and abilities. If, they've, if they'd seen some Christians do the things that Christians should be doing, we wouldn't have Marvel movies. Because move over, uh, what's his name? Iron Man? I got something in my hands too. Huh? Oh, praise the Lord. Y'all, this is this is real good topic to talk about because if, if we can't get connected to God who lives in us, in our spirit, then then you're powerless in this world. Let's finish this scripture here. Just be there simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God and you will begin to sense his grace. You'll begin to what? Sense his grace. Turn over to Hebrews. And uh, chapter, we'll do in the Passion Translation, Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5. Passion Translation. So, help me for a moment. The chapter of faith, the faith chapter. Somebody tell me, what book? What, what chapter? 11. Okay? 12 is a good chapter too. Amen. But it's 11. Amen. So in that chapter, we've got different patriarchs, men and women. And of course, Paul, if Paul wrote it, which seemingly he did, he didn't have time to list everybody. He even said that, don't have time to list it, but he could have listed everybody. Isn't it interesting that pretty much everybody that he listed in the faith chapter that walked by faith and responded in faith that seemed to be such absolute type of you know, decisions, and, and then 
such strong resolve, right? Isn't it interesting that they all had an encounter first? Huh? That's interesting. Now, wait a minute. They all what? They had an encounter first. God appeared to Abraham. Mm. I'm, I'm working on my Bible program one time, and I typed in fasting. Look at my fingers. F-A-S-T-I-N-G. Send. And it came up, believe. Pistis, believe, in the Greek. And I thought, no, wait a minute. I didn't put in believe. I put in fasting. But I'm not as sharp as you. So I went ahead and clicked out. I went, F-A-S-T-I-N-G. Believe. I thought, what's going on with my computer? So I clicked out of it, and then I went to the finger. F-A-S-T-I-N-T. Hmm. Believe. And it came up again. Believe. Pistis. I thought, well, I better read this. And it was in the Vines Expository Dictionary. And it was about Genesis chapter 15. Where remember, Abram wasn't Abraham yet. He went to God and he started questioning him. Now, God can't work with someone who's going to question him. How do I know I'm going to? And what are you going to do to give me this land? God has to settle. He's the umpire. I love that in the Amplified. He's the umpire that settles with all finality every question that would arise in your soul, right? So how does God settle it? Well, the first time he settled it with Abram, he did what? Because Abram said, how do I know I'm going to have this child? Eliezer in my house is the only child. And he said, no, that's not your child. You're going to have a child. He said, go outside and see if you can number the stars. So shall your descendants be. Now, what did he give him the right to do? He told him to go out and look at the stars. Had Abraham ever looked at the stars? Well, probably not. He was asleep. No, he was a moon worshiper. If you worship the moon, what else do you see? Constellations, stars. And when there's no city lights, how many of them do you see? A whole blanket full, right? Right? So was he used to seeing the stars? Absolutely. So what did God give him in, of this world in order to connect to that world to make the promise sure? He gave him something that he already was very keen and very understanding of, which tells you God's not making this difficult. He's not holding out on you. Einstein's law of relativity. When you figure that out, who's Einstein? Well, see, there's your problem. But until you can figure it out, I can't bless you. No, God's not making it hard. God's making it super, super simple. So simple that he figured out if I can somehow come and step inside of them and live in them, they'll know that I'm in there all the time. And then they can access me while they learn about what I've provided them and they'll always have results. God thought that was really cool. But religion got in there and caused us to what? To remove God. I'm gonna, oh, I was getting ready to say something. You're not ready for what I was getting ready to say. You're not ready for what I was going to say. I, I'm going to get run out now. I can tell. I better have my tambourine. So if I get run out, at least I'm going to make a lot of noise while I'm leaving. Did you notice that lady yesterday with the MS? She got up and started walking around. Did you know she just walked out, out in the hallway and just took off? She left. I love that. When people move on is when they secure their healing. Everything Jesus did was to make people move on. Stretch out your hand. Oh, I, I, no, stretch it. Huh. Get up and walk. Oh. Go show yourself. To, oh. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go and behold. Yes. He made them move on. They didn't stay where they were and contemplate whether it was or whether it wasn't, and then let it come back. They moved on. But I was going to say something, but I'm sure you're not ready for it, you know. We have to be even careful that we haven't made the wonderful scriptures and the Bible that we love and has been given to us in this day for a great importance that we haven't made that become our relationship with God. Yeah. You, know that, you know what that's like? 
Betty Crocker and I are cooking, and she says, hey, Jim, go get the salt. And I said, well, wait, let me, let me look at your book first. Now, see, if Betty's there, and she says, go get the salt, and she's that tangible, would I need then to have to go to the book to just say, okay, that's good. I'll put some salt in. No. Does it mean that the Word and the Spirit don't agree? Of course they agree. But when she becomes that tangible, it doesn't mean that I have to find the Scripture in order to validate what she said, although validating what she said is also a part of the Word and the Spirit agreeing. Right? So now, in this friendship, how do we make this work? Well, if God's not that tangible to you, you need something that is. What is it? The Scriptures. But what will the Scriptures lead you to? A tangibility of Him. Because there's a day coming where He's going to say all kinds of things to you. And if you can have that day be right now by faith. It's not a long process. He's actually in you. You've been raised up to sit in heavenly places. Notice you're sitting in the same seat. So it's not like He has to talk loud. The only problem with all of this is, like Jesus who went to a solitary place in the mountain, well, that word place has the meaning of Mount Horeb, which also means desolate. See, you have to come to a place of being desolate, where it's not about you anymore, if you really want to find Him. And that's what Jesus did when He went to that place. He emptied himself of him constantly so that he could have everything about God. But in what manner did he have God? Look at the Mount of Transfiguration. That's the kind of tangibility Jesus had. What do you mean? That's how he prayed. There was such a connection with Jesus and the Father that it didn't say after four months of praying, the power of God began to come out of him. It said as he prayed. The glory began to come out of him. The lightning began to come out of him. The presence of God began to sh overshadow him. And it was so bright and so tangible and so real as he prayed. So if he's living in you, couldn't you have the same experiences? In other words, when you begin to pray, God becomes so real to you. How do you get those? You got to make sure that you empty yourself. Everybody doing okay with this? People say, well, how do I start? Well, you got to know it's available. And then you got to use your faith. But using your faith, the concept of that is it could be a long time then. No, it's instantaneous. The moment I use my faith, I'm there. That's what we found out. Just pray like you're already there. So we would say, okay, I'm already there. And I begin to pray. And everything the Holy Ghost would give us was on the other side. Instead of working to get to the other side, we would immediately begin to enjoy what was on the other side. But it came by faith. And the same thing's true for the way that you walk with him. So what does it look like? Well, I say, well, Lord, I'm going to hear you then. Well, then immediately you step over and say, well, Lord, isn't it wonderful that you're talking to me right now? This is awesome. Hey, what do you think about? And then you begin to what? You begin to role play somebody who actually believes. And that's what Reverend Andy's talking about. What is that belief? You better embrace that. But if you embrace a belief, then you are involved with that belief. If you are not involved with what you embrace, you didn't embrace. And you can always tell whether you embrace it, whether it's yours, whether you're in faith, by what you're involved in. And if it doesn't move you and you don't have inspiration with what you just received, then guess what? You did not, em you did not embrace it and you do not believe it. And this is the thing that we've got to be careful of, of what the world is doing. The world is stealing our affections so that we're no longer excited about Jesus. 
We're excited about the game. We're excited about the shopping. We're excited about this and we're excited about that. But we're not that excited about Jesus. Oh, yeah, I'm got, I guess I go to go to church. Or, oh, yeah, now I'm going to go ahead and do a little prayer time because I feel like I have to. Instead of being so honored that you get to. Because there's other countries where they don't have the kind of time that we have. They don't have the liberties that we have. So we should be so excited. How come I'm not excited? Because you're excited about something else. Yeah. The balance scale swings both ways, and it's always extremely revealing. The Message Bible, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The message is where your treasure is, is where you will most want to be and find yourself being. If you find yourself over here, you can't say, somebody else put me here. That was your choice. You got yourself there. You know, you get out, out of the buffet line and, and you have it stacked this high. So I did not put it on here. Who put it on there? I don't know. I went through the line and all of it just jumped on my plate. No. You know you put that on there. You put every single piece on there. And it's the owning up. Which is really what Reverend Kevin was sharing on Sunday. When he shared about some of the things that possibly all of us have little quirks here and there. That we've allowed ourselves to compromise and get involved in. But not own up to. Oh brother that sounds like works. That has not works at all. That's just allowing hindrances to be in our lives that do not belong there, and your connection is fuzzy. Just like when you don't tune in your radio station, you've got static, and you're wondering why you're here, all this static. It's because you need to fine-tune. Fine-tuning is called clarity. Clarity is the word for focus. And everything about this world is a diversion to keep you from focusing yes. on what you should focus on. That's right. Even Einstein said reality is nothing but a stubborn, persistent illusion. <laughs> what? You mean quarks came together and made molecules that put substance together that looks like it's a cancer? And if I give my attention to it, I keep it. If I divert my attention from it and give it to God, it'll disappear and leave. Nothing but a stubborn, persistent illusion illusion what's the possibility we're fellowshipping with things that have no reality in them at all and the only reason why they stay is because we believe it either way believe god or you believe the world because one thing i know is we are believers you can't back out of that any more than a cat can back out of being a cat and a dog can back out of being a dog. And the reason why a dog barks and doesn't meow is because it's a dog. And the reason why a cat meows and doesn't bark is because it's a cat. And the reason why a believer believes and he doesn't doubt is because he's a believer. And we're believers in this room. And our faith to walk in this other side and know our spirit and know the Holy Ghost is right now at top level. Because we've been taught for 40 years. We just didn't know how to make the connections so that all of a sudden you got lights. But we're finding out in the day that we're living how to get everybody connected until the power's on. And then your believing ability is something you do not have to work on because it's something that you are. You use it every day. I can feel it right now. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now the last thing I'll share, where do I have you turn to? Over here to Hebrews, real quick, so that we can get Robin back up on the piano. And then we're just going to begin to practice some of this. And uh, probably Leanne will have something and she'll pass it to Annie. Amen. But notice what it says in verse 11. It says of chapter 5 in Hebrews, we have much to say about this topic, although it is difficult to explain because you have become too dull and sluggish to understand. Is he, was, he, was he? Yes. Praise the Lord. We might as well just say praise the Lord, right? 
Everybody say praise the Lord. Lord. Come on. It's a sarcastic praise the Lord. You can do better than that. Praise the Lord. Do a little bit better. Praise the Lord. Right? It's not real heartfelt, but we might as well say it anyhow. Because he just kind of read our mail. Every single one of us in here. And I'd be the worst. You say, why? Because of those that are sitting in this, this room that are ministering with me. I've been saved the longest. And if you've been saved the longest, you ought to know them the best. Anybody in here saved longer than 58 years? Might be. But I'm using me that way to get you off the hook, okay? (laughs) If you've been saved for 58 years plus, you ought to know somebody. How long did it take you to know your spouse? Now, I realize you get to know them continually, and there's some new things you'll find out about them, but not too many. After a little bit, you know them well enough to function with them every single day and have nothing but one testimony after another. We don't have to know everything about Jesus. If we could just hear his voice and recognize his presence like two sinners did called Cain and Abel in the old covenant. Yeah. Amen. Mm-hmm. We, could, we could change the world as Christians. I'll say it again. What, what uh, Cain had, even before he murdered his brother Abel. Now think about that. He's conceptualized murder. It's in his heart. And yet he can recognize the presence of God and hear him in complete sentences. So that he could talk right back to him when he said, where's my brother? Am I my brother's keeper? (laughs) And then God had to talk to him in complete sentences. And notice what God even said to him. Getting ready to commit murder. He's a full sinner. And yet God said, you, the sin lies at the door and it desires you, but you should rule it. The word rule there is the same word for dominion that God gave Adam. That means that sinner still had dominion. Which means, I don't care if the devil had Adam's dominion or not. He still can't make you do what you choose not to do. He cannot override your choice. How much more we who are sons of God seated at the right hand of God. We ought to know his voice and hear him in complete sentences. And we ought to recognize his presence. Oh, brother Jim, I really want to get there. I really want to. Then by faith. You hear his voice in complete sense. And by faith, you recognize that he's on the inside of you. We have to revisit those places where we fan that flame and bring these things to a place where the combustion of them overwhelms and overtakes our life. It's not that he's not in there. You are just got dull and sluggish, just like me. The world will do that. It'll dull you to the point where you're not sharp like you ought to be. And you're too slow. You're not quick like you ought to be. And we're not thinking like we ought to be. Come on. How come the guy that made the apple wouldn't let his kids have the devices? Because he knew so well that those devices would dumb down their ability to think. Now... The normal human being on the planet can only focus for six to eight seconds before they're diverted. And focus means clarity. And clarity is how things open up in the spirit. So if you're supposed to wait upon the Lord, if you're supposed to be still and experience and know that he is God, can you do it in six seconds? You can't stop thinking about what you've been thinking about and what you've been involved with in the course of your day in six to, six to eight seconds. How do I know that? Because of the looks on people's faces as we worship. It's usually not until 30 minutes or 40 minutes to somebody goes, glory. Why? Because they're dealing with what they're dealing with and they're just singing the song to sing the song. But the moment that they enter in, the glory starts to come and all of a sudden we've got ourselves a service. People say, how come it takes God so long before he can heal a person? Because it takes that long until they get out of their own way. We've learned to get in our way. And that's one of the secrets to the success of your spiritual relationship with God. Get yourself out of the way. Amen. I'm in my own way with my golf swing because I, I'm, I want it so bad. Do you realize you can want God so bad that you're in your way and you don't have him? There you go. 
Because if you want him past the place of having just a healthy desire, it means every bit past that says, I believe I don't have him. That's why I have to want him more. So it's healthy to want him. But then believe that you have him. We miss so much because we won't get out of our way. What you left on it? I'm sure it's something that you did. For you should already be professors instructing others by now. But instead, you need to be taught from the beginning the basics of God's prophetic oracles. You're like children still needing milk and not ready to digest solid food. The King James says, you're what? You're not, you're, you're unskilled in the word of righteousness. And he goes on to say here, for every spiritual infant who lives on milk is not yet pierced by the revelation of righteousness. But solid food is for the mature whose spiritual senses perceive heavenly matters. So being skilled in righteousness is being aware and perceptive of spiritual things. And they have been adequately trained by what they've experienced. See, if no one's experiencing anything, then you're not being trained. Because to be mature is to be skilled in righteousness, which leads to spiritual perception. You know, when Joseph Prince came out, and if you don't, you don't like him, shame on you. Shame on you. God raised him up to give a message of grace. If you don't like the first John 1, 9, if you can't live like Brother Hagin showed us to live, eat the hay, spit out the sticks, and go on and find the truth that really would set you free, then shame on you. You never listened to the prophet in the first place. I'm saying that really strongly. Because the message was brought out to the word of faith to help us to get out of works. You've been working and working and working and working and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing from the Bible, trying to get something out of the Bible that it takes the Holy Ghost to help you to get that something out of the Bible. Yeah. Romans 10, 17 does not say faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Logos over and over and over and over and over and over again. It says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the rhema. Aaron, could you get me a Kleenex, please? Did it take me saying that 15 times and her hearing it over and over and over and over and over again to believe she could get a Kleenex? No. You know why? Because there's tangibility there. And I'm hearing her like she's a person. And she's hearing me like, she, like I'm a person. When God speaks to you, you don't have to hear it 100 times. I'm, I'm sorry to say that the times he spoke audibly to me, I asked him to say it two more times. Not because I didn't hear it the first time, because it amazed me what he said. Lord, did you really say? But that sure beats weeks and months and years of trying to hear something to get something to make sure you've got faith down in your heart in order for you to get a blessing and for you to get an answer. And that's called works. And it took a message of God's grace to set us free from the works to realize that he's not putting you under that system any longer. You have nothing to do with the law. And this is why a friendship is so beautiful with the Lord. Because it's not a requirement of what you do or what you've done or where you need to be. 
He placed you in a place. He gave you his authority. He gave you his obedience. He gave you his righteousness for you to enjoy the relationship by faith, not by works. And it takes the Holy Ghost to even bring out of the beautiful word that we've been given, the revelation. So you're still listening to him while you're reading. Why haven't we put more emphasis on him, on him, on him, on him, on him? And this is the confidence we have in him. Righteousness is my go past go and collect $200. It's my get out of jail. It's my pass into the very presence of the Lord. It's the reason why I never am excluded from everything that my friend wants to share with me. It's the reason why my perceptions are open to the spiritual realm. It's the reason why Reverend Enny talked about my spiritual senses. One day I was thinking about that and I said, isn't it interesting that I can use my earthly senses on demand? Excuse me? On demand. If my physical man is but a mere reflection of my spiritual man, so the real person I am is the spiritual man and he has senses, why wouldn't I be able to use those senses on demand as well as I can use my physical senses on demand? It has everything to do with recognition and awareness. And if religion's taken that part away, that's why we feel so far away from him. We've been deceived into thinking he's so far out there and we're so far behind. We've got so much to do for him to love us enough to tell us what he wants to tell us. Not realizing that Jesus did all of that preliminary work for us so that we could enjoy the person and every tool that he has given us to increase our awareness is what we can use every day. Praying in the Holy Ghost, worship, meditation, reading the scriptures, studying them and finding out what they say. Those are our tools so that he and I can enjoy. And he walks with me and he talks with me. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. And the joy I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. Mm. Are we hearing something this morning? I don't even know what time it is. I've gotten lost here. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. Isn't it interesting as I close that the education, in other words, the experiences I'm being trained, is in the experiences that separate what is good and what is evil. That's what maturity does. Maturity is being skilled in righteousness to come and take advantage of our ability to have relationship. It sensitizes us to the spiritual world and we begin to get trained out of the experiences from that world which help to bring an absolute delineation or distinction between what is and what isn't. The more chaste choices you make to connect your spirit to God, the more really becomes. The more choices you make to connect your flesh to the world, the more real it becomes. Mm, a lot of things we could say, but that's enough, that's enough, that's enough. Is everybody seeing this? Oh, don't you just know you know him right now? Hallelujah, thank you, Lord. I know his voice. Oh, I hear him speak. I feel his presence. Hallelujah. From my head down to my feet. Oh, the presence of the Lord is so sweet. And the joy we share.
And he tells me I am his own And the joy we share Just begin to worship right now, real quietly as she plays. Father, we draw near as you draw near. We sense you as you sense us. The body for the Lord, the Lord for the body. Spirit to spirit, flesh of his flesh, bone of his bone. One with the Lord, inseparable. We've died. Now we're enjoying our second existence, which is simply Jesus using our body. Christ lives in me. The great mystery of the church. Christ in you, the hope of glory. <coughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Either of you guys have anything? Come on up right now. Be a good time. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, can you feel them down in your heart? Say by faith. Yes, I can. Mm, 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 mm. Yes, I can. I can feel him right now. I can. He's living in me. I can feel him. Praise the Lord. Like I can feel the life in my body. I can feel the life in his body. And he's living in mine. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Can you hear him? If you can hear yourself think. You can hear God think. I say it again. If you can hear yourself think, you can hear God think because He's thinking through you. Can you hear Him think right now? Hallelujah. Can you hear His voice right now? How much He loves you. He's calling you righteous. He's calling you pure. He's calling you holy. Step right on over and be right there. For the presence of the Lord begins to fall in this place as hearts begin to open and they give Him space. Oh, thank you. Come on, he's telling you what you need to hear. He's sharing with you what you need to know. And he's revealing to you and showing you which way to go. See it, see it, see it. Hear it, hear it, hear it. Know it, know it, know it. <laughs> Some of you need to laugh because it's so real now. Who pre fine form praying fine songstein? Son bringing sting of Cosiris to the Easter Rosta. Eritorodi of Sapa da Manche, Repede Kenia, Fropa da Manche, Idia Pobra Menga de Bench, Repede Bene Vistidia, Dogla Magaji, the Gishi, Jesu Rosta, Langeri, 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 Malaysia, Roba, Shurama, Shoboba, 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 and the joy we share as we tarry there, none of 